In the beginning, there was only God. And since he was completely perfect and completely happy, there was nothing he needed. Yet out of his goodness, he chose to create, and all he willed came into being. The heavens and the earth, and all that is visible and invisible. One after another, he made the light, the stars, the sky, the earth, with all its plants and animals, and then last of all, he made the human beings. Man, like the animals, was made out of particles of the earth, but God made him different from the animals and made him like himself, for into a man or a woman's body, which would die, he breathed a soul which would never die. Well, many people thought that was just a tale, like a fairy tale, a made-up story. Many people thought that. I mean, how could someone with no hands and no eyes make things, they thought? If God is a spirit who cannot be seen or touched or heard, why, how could he make the stars that sparkle overhead? The sea, which is always astir. The flowers and the wonderful scent that the flowers produce. They thought, well, maybe he can make invisible things, but how could he make things that we can see, visible things? So some people were thinking, well, it's all very well to say that God is everywhere, but who has ever set eyes on him? And how can we be sure he's everywhere? And they tell us he's the master whom everything and everybody obeys, but huh, why should we believe that? And, you know, really it does kind of seem impossible. We who have hands couldn't do those things, so how could someone who has no hands do them? And we can imagine animals and plants and rocks obeying God. I mean, can we imagine that? They, the animals don't understand when we talk to them, so how could they be obedient to God? And how could the winds and the seas and the mountains obey? I mean, we can shout and scream at the sea and the mountains and trees and all that all day long, and do they do what we want? Well, no, they, they can't even hear us, much less obey us. And that really is sort of how it seems to us. But, as you are going to see, everything that exists, whether it has life or not, by the very fact of being there, it actually obeys the will of God. You see, God's creatures do not know that they are obeying. Those that are inanimate just go on existing, and those that have life move and go on living. Yet, every time a cool breeze brushes your cheek, its voice is saying, Lord, I obey. When the sun rises in the morning, and it puts out beautiful colors on the ocean. The sun and its rays and the sea water are all whispering, Lord, I obey. When you see the birds flying overhead or butterflies flapping their wings, a piece of fruit fall to the ground, they are all saying, I hear, and Lord, I obey. At first, there was chaos, and darkness was everywhere. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Before that, there was only the deep, an immensity of space, with no beginning and no end. 
indescribably dark and cold. Who can imagine that immensity of darkness and coldness? When we think of dark, we think of night. But our night would be like brilliant sunshine in comparison with that darkness. And when we think of cold, we think of ice. But ice is positively hot if you compare it with the coldness of space. The space that separates the stars. As hot, you might say, as a blazing furnace from which no heat can escape. And in this measureless void of cold and darkness, light was created. There appeared something like a vast, fiery cloud, which included all the stars that are in the sky. The whole universe was in that cloud, and amongst the tiniest of stars was our own sun. But they were not stars then. As yet, they were nothing except light and heat. So intense was the light that all the substances we know, iron, earth, rocks, gold, water, everything existed as gases, as insubstantial as air. They were fused together in one vast, flaming intensity of light and heat. Heat which would make our sun today feel like a piece of ice. This raging, fiery cloud of nothingness, too huge to imagine, moved in the immensity of freezing space. The fiery mass was no bigger than a drop of water in that ocean of space. And as, as this cloud of light and heat moved through the empty space, little drops fell from it. Like if you swing some water around in a glass, some of it holds together and the rest breaks up into little drops. Well, the countless hosts of stars that are up in our sky are like these little drops. Only instead of falling, they are moving around in space in such a way that they can never meet. They are millions and millions of miles away from each other. <laughs> they are so far away that it takes the light of some of them millions of years just to reach us. And do you know how fast light travels? Like a hundred miles an hour? Two hundred miles an hour? Does light travel at a thousand miles an hour? No. Light travels much faster at 186,000 miles every second. In every second of time, light travels 186,000 miles. Well, imagine how fast that is. That means that in one second, light can travel around our Earth seven times. And you know how big our world is? It's 25,000 miles around. Our Earth, 25,000 miles around. And light travels so fast that in one second, it can go around our Earth seven times. In the time that it takes you to snap your fingers, light can go around our Earth seven times. That's how fast it travels. 
and our Earth is so big at 25,000 miles, if we were to get in a car and drive at 100 miles an hour and not stop for anything, to go day and night and day and night, not stopping for anything at 100 miles an hour, it would take us more than 10 days to get around our Earth. That's how big it is. You know, one wouldn't think so. I mean, the sun doesn't look so big, but that is because the sun is so far away. The light from the sun, going at 186,000 miles a second, takes eight minutes to reach us. And if we were to travel at 100 miles an hour, Without stopping, you know how long it would take to get from here to the sun? 106 years. That's how far away our Earth is from the sun. In fact, the sun is one million times bigger than our Earth. And it is so big, it is so big that just one One of the sun's flames, like you see all these flames coming off the sun, our Earth, our Earth, 22 of our Earths could fit in just one little flame. Isn't that amazing? And these charts that I have up here, you guys have in Mr. George's room. You have these charts in your classroom and you can certainly look at them later on today or some other time. Just like we have them in our classroom here. Well, when God's will called the stars into being, there was no detail he had not planned. Every scrap of the universe, every speck which we might think of as being too tiny, was given a set of rules to follow. Think of that. Everything was given a set of rules to follow. To the little particles which are like smoke, like vapor, which could only be distinguished as light and heat, moving at a fantastic speed, he said, as you become cold, you will move closer and closer together. And as they cooled, they moved closer and closer together, occupying less and less space. And these particles, as they cooled, assumed different states of being, which we call solid, liquid, and the gaseous state. Everything we know, everything we know is either a gas, a liquid, or a solid. And which of these three states it's in at any time depends upon how hot or cold it is. Solid, liquid, gas. Then God gave other instructions. For each of the tiny particles was given a special love for certain particles and a special dislike for others. Some of the particles were attracted to each other and some were not. Just like human beings, they like some and they don't really have much to do with others. So all the particles of the earth, 
and all the particles everywhere in space are attracted to some other particles and with some other particles they just don't want to have a whole lot to do with it. Those particles are attracted to each other. Those are not. Those particles are attracted to each other. Those particles are attracted to each other. But some are not. Those are not. In the solid state, God made particles cling so closely together that they are almost <clears throat> that they are almost impossible to separate. And in the solid state, they form the particles form a body which will not alter its shape. Nathan, unless one applies force. Like, if a piece is broken off, the particles still cling together. If you cut up an apple, all the pieces of the apple still cling together. That's in the solid state. But, when it came to liquids, God said something different. God said to liquids, you shall hold together also, but not so very closely like with the solids. He said, liquids, he said to them, you will have no shape of your own, but you'll roll over each other instead. Thus you shall flow and spread, and the liquids, he said, you will fill up every crevice and hollow. You will push downwards and sideways, but liquids never push upwards. That is why, although we can put our hands in water, it will separate and go sideways. We can't put our hands through a rock. And to the gases, he said, your particles shall not cling together at all. They can move freely in all directions. But as the particles were also different individuals, they did not become solid or liquid or gas at the same time. At certain temperatures, some remained solid. At other temperatures, some became liquid. And at some temperatures, some particles became gas. And so, while obeying these laws, the little drop of nothingness that was to become our world, the blazing mass went on spinning and spinning around itself and also spinning and revolving around our sun in the tremendous cold of space. And as time went on, the outer particles of our earth began to dance, a dance of the elements. The particles that were at the outmost edge of our earth became cold and they shrank down. They huddled together and they hurried to the earth. But as soon as they approached the earth, the hotter they became and then they went back up. And like little angels, they carried a bucket of hot burning coal 
up into space and returned with some ice. So over time, the Earth began to cool. The outer part of the Earth gradually got cooler and cooler and cooler. And it took so, so long for this to happen. But think of it, how simple it is. If you become hot, you expand. And as you expand, you become lighter and you soar upwards like a little bubble of air in a glass of water. But if you become cold, you shrink down like a grain of sand that sinks to the bottom of a pond. And because of this law, the earth gradually changed from a ball of fire to the earth that we know now. This was the law that these tiny radiant particles obeyed as they danced their dance. Particles too small to be seen or even imagined, yet numerous enough to have produced the world. And for hundreds and thousands and millions and millions of years, this dance went on, this cooling of the earth. <clears throat> Finally, the particles settled down. Like tired dancers, they settled down, one after another. First they became liquid, then they became solid. And as they became solid or liquid, some of them joined others to which they were attracted, and they became new substances. The heavier ones went near to the heart of the earth where it was warmer, and the lighter ones floated up above them, like oil floating on water. Look at that. That sunk to the bottom. Now watch this. That's floating on top. So think of what's happening to the earth now. It's changing so much. Things are cooling. And as they cool, they move down. And on the outside of the earth, <clears throat> as it was cooling, a thin scum was formed, sort of like a skin. If you've ever boiled milk and you leave it to cool, there's a, a thin layer of like scum on the top. Or if you've ever made pudding, you have it nice and hot, and then you put it into little bowls and it cools down and there's like a little scum that forms on the top, a little layer that forms on the top. Well, that's what happened with our earth. The earth had taken some shape, but the elements inside the earth were feeling, they were still very hot and they felt trapped. They wanted to get out. Well, those are the laws. If you're hot, you want to expand. And there was no place to expand, so they burst out. They broke the skin, <clears throat> and it were, there was a terrible fight.
the water that formed on the surface turned immediately into vapor and went up as the hot stuff came out from inside the earth. There were also ashes and a veil of clouds was drawn to cover the earth so that nobody could see what was going on. And the sun, the sun was ashamed of them. This big covering of clouds all around the earth as the volcanoes were erupting. The sun became ashamed of them. But eventually, <clears throat> the fighting ceased. As everybody cooled down more, and more gases became liquid, more and more liquids became solids. The earth itself shrank and became wrinkled like an apple that you might leave in a cupboard then you discover it a few weeks later and it's all kind of old and wrinkled up. Well, the wrinkles are like the mountains and the hollows are like the oceans and the seas. And then it began to rain and rain and rain. And there was so much rain that came down that it filled up the hollows and soon we had our oceans and we had our seas because of all the rain that came. Thus our oceans were formed. Above them there was air, the air that we breathe. And that cloud that used to be there gradually disappeared. The veil was withdrawn and the sun could now see the earth. And the sun smiled again on its earth, its beautiful little daughter the earth. Rocks, water, air, liquids and gases, today as it was yesterday and millions of years ago, God's laws are obeyed in the same way. The world spins around itself and rotates around the sun. And the earth and all of its elements and compounds that the earth is made of, as they fulfill their task, they whisper with one voice, Lord, thy will be done. We obey. And that's the end of our story of God with no hands.